Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from allutuses.com and welcome to this video on period 3 oxides. So in this video we're going to look at the uh, how the structure and bonding of period 3 oxides uh, can impact on their melting points and um, we're also going to look at the um, acidic and basic properties of period 3 oxides and show some equations uh, and some observations as well when you do these reactions. So we're going to start with the um, structure and bonding bit first. So oxides of period 3 uh, exist in uh, different forms, as I'm going to show you on here. And you do need to be able to explain uh, the variation in melting points according to how they're structured and the type of bonding they have as well. So we're going to start with um, what we've got here, which is our graph. Uh, and this shows us the melting point in degrees Celsius. Uh, we've got some negative values here as well. And we've also got uh, our oxides. I've already put the oxides that uh, can naturally form and uh, that we're actually interested in for the exam board. So we're going to start with sodium oxide first. Now, sodium oxide, sodium is in group one. It forms an oxide of Na2O. It is a melting point of um, just below one and a half thousand degrees Celsius. Um, and in purple here, you can see that it forms a giant ionic structure. So that means that you've got a positive and a negative ion that's electrically, electrically statically uh, attracted to each other. And um, this forms a quite a strong giant ionic structure. Now, if we go up to magnesium oxide, it has a significantly higher melting point. And this is because the uh, ions that are attracting each other are much bigger. So magnesium is in group two, has a two plus ion, and uh, oxygen is obviously in group six, that has an O2 minus. So that bigger attraction means the electrostatic attraction is that much greater, and therefore the energy required to overcome these very strong forces. Uh, is a lot higher, and that's why the melting point is significantly higher. Uh, surprisingly, if we come down to aluminium oxide, it's actually a bit lower, despite the fact that we have a bigger charge between the positive and negative. And this is because aluminium oxide has some covalent character, uh, and this distorts the electrons uh, away from an ionic, uh, a very strong ionic attraction, uh, and hence the melting point is a bit lower for aluminium oxide. It is nonetheless classed as a giant ionic compound because it is mainly ionic in, char in character. Okay, so if we go on to the next one, silicon dioxide, uh, this is the first and only one which is a giant covalent structure in period three. Um, so this is um, a bit like a similar structure to diamond, very large, and again, quite a high melting point uh, of just over one and a half thousand degrees Celsius. Okay, if we come down even further, we've got big drops here, and these are lower than any of the ones that we've had so far. This is phosphorus oxide or phosphorus pentoxide. Uh, and phosphorus pentoxide is a simple covalent molecule, very small, doesn't form giant structures. Therefore, it has weak intermolecular forces between the molecules. Uh, and this means that their melting point is dramatically reduced compared to the rest of them. Uh, and if we go on to the last one here, which is sulfur dioxide, again, a much simpler molecule, even, com even in comparison to phosphorus oxide. Uh, and that means that it is a simple covalent molecule with a very low melting point. Uh, and that's why it's actually below the zero mark. Uh, and as you would expect, sulfur dioxide is actually a gas at room temperature. OK, uh, we're going to come back to these as well uh, and link them in with how they react, because it is actually quite important. OK, so we're going to look at some of the acidic and basic properties of these. So um, we're going to look at sodium oxide first. Now, as we said this is ionic, a very giant ionic structure. This will dissolve, uh, like most ionic compounds will, they're readily soluble in water, and it will dissolve to form sodium plus and 2OH minus, hence the ionic character of this. Uh, there's a pH of 40, uh, as it forms a readily soluble sodium hydroxide compound, uh, and so it therefore forms an alkaline solution. Okay, magnesium oxide will do the same, it will react as well. Um, it doesn't react as readily, that, uh, well, it reacts as, it reacts reasonably well, it's partially soluble, but the hydroxide that's formed is not very soluble. And because it doesn't dissolve very well, uh, then we don't get a strong base as we do with sodium oxide. You can see I've written the equation anyway, so this is magnesium oxide reacting with water, it'll dissolve water and it'll form this uh, partially soluble magnesium hydroxide. And what I've done is I've written the uh, equilibrium that the magnesium hydroxide exists in when it's in solution. 
uh, and it will form magnesium 2 plus and 2 OH minuses. But like I say, because it is partially soluble, you don't get many OH minuses, not as many as we do with sodium oxide when that reacts with water. Uh, and so therefore the um, pH of this is generally a bit lower. Uh, and that's why I put pH 10 on the end there. Okay, if we go to the next uh, elements along, aluminium and silicon, these two compounds are really, really strong, uh, strong giant structures. So, for example, aluminium oxide is a lot of covalent character in there. Silicon dioxide is giant covalent, very, very strong bonds between them. Water can't break these up. They're insoluble in water, so therefore they don't react. So we don't need to do any equations for them. Okay, if we come on to our next one, which is phosphorus oxide. Now, phosphorus oxide reacts vigorously with water, very, very reactive. Uh, and it will react with water to form phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4. Now, phosphoric acid will uh, dissociate to form H plus ions and H2PO4 minus. Uh, this is strongly acidic and has a pH of somewhere between 0 and 2. Um, and this is a non-metal, remember. This is a simple covalent molecule, which is P4O10. Okay, if we go to the next one, sulfur dioxide, this is this white misty fume, it's very choking gas, fairly soluble in water, uh, and it will react to form sulfurous acid, which is H2SO3. Watch out for that really, really carefully. Sulfur dioxide does form sulfurous acid, not sulfuric acid directly. Uh, and this will dissociate like any other acid, and it will dissociate to form H plus and HSO3 minus. The pH is 0 to 2. If we go on to the last one, which is SO3, now this is a, a, a more oxidized version of sulfur dioxide. This is called sulfur trioxide. Now this does react vigorously with water uh, and it will produce sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4. And this is the acid that you may be more uh, associated with. So you've got, uh, this will dissociate like sulfurous acid, which will uh, produce H plus and HSO4 minus. Uh, dissociate quite readily, just like sulfurous acid, and um, produces a pH of somewhere between 0 and 2. Now, you'll notice a slight trend going down this, or going across the period. When we start with our ionic compounds, our ionic oxides, uh, they generally form, well, they do, they form um, uh, alkaline solutions. So we see pH 14 and pH 10 in the middle, uh, the giant uh, covalent ion with some giant covalent character, in them uh, are insoluble in water, but as we come on to the non-metal simple covalent molecules, these will form acidic hydroxides, um, and, and that's the general trend. Now, just a final point. The reason why oxides are classed as bases is because the oxide, which is O2 minus, can attract electrons, uh, can, sorry, can attract protons quite readily from water molecules. So um, things like magnesium oxide, like O2 minus, can easily pull the proton away from the water and hence form hydroxide ions. And that's the reason why oxides are classed as bases, especially the ionic ones like at the top there. But um, that's it. Make sure you can explain your reactions. Make sure you know which ones are covalent and ionic and describe the trends in terms of melting points. And make sure you remember your equations, especially the sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide. That's it. Hope that helps. Bye.